tonight's presentation is around JC listed hold codes. Um, as a matter of interest, I dropped that term into, into an AI art generator and came up with this uh, wonderfully abstract picture. You know, we're all trying to get our heads around AI and part of that is playing with the new technologies. Um, but I decided to include that picture because it is actually a wonderful representation of how colorful this sector is. There's all sorts of things, lots of different underlyings. It's, it's, really, it's really quite an abstract uh, impressionist uh, uh, capturing this, uh, this really, really colorful and complex part, part of the JSE. So jumping, jumping away from uh, arts criticism into, into what we're going to talk about tonight, first I just want to introduce integral asset management. We, that's is a hold co pros and cons and when i talk about a, a, an appropriate discount what is my methodology i have because we're talking about 12 different hold codes and each of those hold codes have underlying companies there's a vast amount of material to go through tonight so how do we condense this into 40 45 minutes of of a presentation leaving time for for questions well i use i use checklists um, more subtly and embedded in that, there, there is implicit assumptions. I use summaries. Um, and because of that, some of the complexity of the detail might be lost. Um, it is still there. I'm not smoothing over it, not avoiding it. Um, I'm also, also just trying to get through it. There's a lot, lot to talk about. And then obviously the meat of the presentation this evening is the JC listed hold codes, where we run through them. A summary and conclusion, hopefully we've got plenty of time for questions. So first of all, jumping into what is, uh, who is Integral Asset Management? Who are we? Well, we're a long only global and domestic uh, asset manager. It's simplistically, how we invest is we like good companies. Uh, we prefer paying uh, inexpensive valuations you know, uh, for them. We like companies that are growing and we like diversified portfolios. Simplistically, intuitively that's our investment process we've got a range of offerings most of the most of the uh people dialed in uh, this evening uh the domestic seg portfolios and the offshore seg portfolios or global seg portfolios are, are more applicable but we've got uh, we've got funds local domestic we run institutional mandates we have access to lots of list platforms so we can we can uh, offer a uh, full service long only investment uh, uh, offering. Shifting to what is a hold co, we need to define what we're talking about uh, tonight. So conceptually or visually, hold co listed on a JSE will have a range of underlying investments. Now that's a little simplistic, so let's jump into some more details. Essentially, a hold co is uh, and hold co is shorthand for a holding company or even a, a longer definition as an investment holding company. Really, a hold co refers to a company whose primary characteristic is it itself actually invests in other businesses. It doesn't have an underlying operation. The businesses it invests in have underlying operations. Its business is the business of allocating capital. Um, typically, market and management judge this performance predominantly by the growth in its net asset value. What is net asset value? It is the equity in the group or the underlying, if we take the assets and we subtract the liabilities, the net asset value, uh, and typically that divided by the number of shares in the market arrives at a net asset value per share. The world's most famous hold co is arguably Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, um, uh, run this business, they have run this business forever and a day. Um, I feel like we're getting into the last innings for them and there'll be a second generation of manager that takes, takes over. But during their watch, $10,000 invested into Berkshire Hathaway in 1964, $10,000 would be worth over half a billion dollars today. It shows you the power of uh, letting someone else manage your money effectively, which is what investing in a whole co is. The JSC, the JSC actually has in their listing requirements in section 15, they've got a section dedicated to what they call investment entities. 
whose principal underlying activity is the investment security, specifically referring to investment companies, private equity companies, active private equity companies, investment trusts, and unit trusts. There's a range of criteria here, but there is a section on the JSC listing requirements, section 15, that is dedicated to them that is worth referencing as well. So that is what a Holdco is. It is, once again, once again, zooming back to this graphic now makes more sense. On the JSC, you've got one company listed. It itself doesn't, in fact, have necessarily an operational business. It is an allocator of capital into other businesses, in fact, as an investor into them. And those businesses run, uh, run operational businesses. And this Holco aims to grow its net asset value. What are the pros and cons and what is an appropriate discount? Well, a lot can philosophically be uh, argued around this, but briefly, the pros of, a, of investing in a whole code is you gain access to potentially unique and diversified underlying investments. And these investments may not be accessible by any other investor any other way. Um, they may not be listed separately. So it gives you really unique and diversified underlyings, you get to benefit by investing in the whole in the whole co where management skill and the experience in investing can create growth. In other words, it's almost like giving them a portion of your capital to manage, and they're taking that capital and making investments, and you get to coattail ride along with their skill and experience at growing that capital. And often and and opportunely, these whole co's listed in stock markets around the world can, can often trade at nice discounts to the underlying net asset values. So we don't just get to uh, access to a great portfolio that, and, and leveraging and harnessing management skills and experience of growing it, we can get that access at a discount. What are the cons? What is, what is the bad pro parts of, of, of hold co investing? Well, not all hold co management are actually good investors. Just because they're there, and they've got an empire and they're running it, doesn't necessarily mean they're one, running it for you, or two, they're running it well. Um, and what I mean by not running it for you, well, there's a layer of costs and we'll get to that, but you're not just investing in the underlying, you are investing through a whole co and that whole co has costs and management can be some of those costs. Um, also consider the fact that not all underlying portfolios are equal. You get the good with the bad in the portfolio. Um, so why, and jumping to this pro where I talk about you can sometimes get them at large discounts, that discount can be justified because there's an added layer of cost, but what is an appropriate discount? Well, consider for a moment that we can take those costs, we can apply assumptions to them, present value them, and take that out of the net asset value. And that's what I talk about as an appropriate discount. Let's zoom into that. What is an expense? How expensive is too expensive for, for a hold co management team running the hold co? Yeah, how much is too much extra costs? Well, a way to view them is not in isolation. You know, is a million rand a lot, is a hundred million rand a lot, is a billion rand a lot, is an extra cost? Well, it depends on the size of the underlying portfolio. So what I like to do is I'll take the whole co-costs and it's, it, one has to make some assumptions here because it's there are lots of moving pieces um, and you'll see sometimes I don't have finite costs, I have ranges of costs and take them out as net asset values of the whole co costs, uh, arrive at a percentage, I then apply inflation and interest rates. Effectively, I'm building a perpetuity here. What I mean by that is I've got a rule of thumb formula. In South Africa, let's assume a long running inflation rate of 5% and a long running average cost of equity of about 15%. Hold codes are not temporary structures, they're permanent structures. So let's assume that these costs are almost like a, an annuity going into, into eternity, otherwise known as a perpetuity. And we can take the whole costs uh, as a percentage of the net asset value and chop out uh, or divide by the cost of equity less the inflation rate we expect that layer of cost to grow by. 
and arrive at an appropriate discount to NAV. This is a bit technical. I can answer questions on it. I don't want to linger on it. The point is you're trying to create a present value of all future costs in this added layer of costs to arrive at an appropriate discount. Um, then this is jumping into the checklist uh, that I do apply um, and I try to almost like a template, but but not all whole codes are built the same. But I try to try to run you through my thoughts when approaching a new hold co. First of all, and key and obvious question is what is the hold co invested in? A consideration is how much of these investments are listed versus unlisted. And there's pros and cons in this. Listed investments, well, I can go and buy them directly. I don't need a hold co for. But I also don't need to guess what their valuation is. So we have stronger, firmer net asset values, firmer valuations for listed investments. I don't need to check them as closely, but I can also buy them directly. So should there be such a large discount on it versus unlisted investments where I have unique access through the whole code to these unlisted investments that can do things that can be in spaces that I just can't get in the listed environment. But then I have to ask the question, what are they valued as? And it creates a slightly softer net asset value and I need to interrogate then the underlying and see if I'm comfortable with how management has portrayed the value of these investments. I then run into a, a workout whole co costs as a percentage of net asset value. I've explained that. I use that ratio to arrive at my sense of an appropriate discount. I then consider the current discount to net asset value that the share price offers. And I dig into other nuances, internal versus external Manco, the size, central gearing versus subsidiary gearing, liquidity of the share, capital management uh, uh, commitments, management shareholding, and a range of other things. Conceptually, stand back. It is always worth asking, why does a hold co exist? Why is this there? And Sometimes if you can't answer that correctly, it creates lots of problems. Um, but sometimes there's very good reasons why a whole co exists that make you understand a lot of the answers to these questions. Um, that is the conceptual background that I'm going to apply into whole co's. Um, let me jump to the first. So what the first is African Rainbow Capital. What are they invested into? They're, they're invested into the data only telcos rain. They've got a range of other investments from time bank, domestic and global. I've lumped them together. You can split them out separately. Crops is a mining group, uh, Alexander Forbes. They've got their own investment to their own fund, Blue Spec and a range of others. The range of others, if you dig through, there's a long tail in African rainbow capital. But the bulk, we're looking at about two thirds of their investments are sitting in rain, so we're talking telcos, and let's let's be let's be slightly conservative. Call it startup data only telcos, startup um, online only banking, um, startup crops, uh, so specialized mining, and then we've got they've got more generic uh, investments uh, in Alexander Forbes and the like. So, what are they invested in? Diversified financials and industrials. Ironically, that that is the focus, but their largest investment is 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 rain in the telco space. Listed versus unlisted, 90% of the investments are unlisted. This is where some of the problems start to appear. Where what are the whole co costs as a percentage of NAV? African Rainbow Capital is a very expensively managed whole co. Two and a half to three percent of NAV is my best estimate for how you slice and dice things for how much their whole co costs. Now to their credit, they've acknowledged that there was a problem. They are engaging and they're in a process to review their fee to manage this. Um, we could talk about that where, the, where they're going to apply cost cost plus a margin and there is some, some uh, performance fees and the performance fees are, are perhaps in my opinion too low because uh, you can just invest in the 10 year government bond and, and beat that performance fee. But it is under under review. We will see how it lands and we will give them 12 to 24 months to see what that actual cost is. For now, I'm using the old one. The 
old whole code cost as a percentage of NAV determine once again, and a, and a rule of thumb is divide this by 10% and you arrive at, uh, at an appropriate discount on NAV if it's an SA, SA Inc. hold co. Um, and they determine a 25 to 30% discount to NAV. How are they currently trading? Well, they're currently trading at a 26% discount to NAV. So if anything, the market is actually fairly priced in them. They've got an external manco, hence perhaps this problem with, uh, with, with the uh, expense of the manco. And there is minority leakage. Some of their funds they don't own directly, they're owned through ARK Investments that has external shareholders in. There is minority leakage in some of the structure that makes me less comfortable. Who gets the best investments? African Rainbow Capital, the listed company, or, F or the unlisted funds uh, with outside shareholders? So that's African Rainbow Capital. Let's jump to Astoria. Astoria is a Mauritian structure that has strong tax benefits. They report in dollars, but predominantly the assets are, are currently in rands. Nothing stopping them investing offshore, but the, the uh, asset managers here, the, their network, their expertise, their domain knowledge and their strength, I believe, does lie predominantly domestically. What are they invested in? Their largest investment by far is outdoor investment holdings. What is it? They're the holder of Safari Outdoor, which is really a specialist retail uh, um, business. They offering, and uh, I'm gonna offering effectively. If if you're going hunting, if you're going outdoor, the, the range of products. Uh, the range of brands they offer, increasingly house brands, which is quite interesting. Um, they will, you, you'll probably be able to talk about this part a lot better than I will, but that's what they offer. It's a really niche, higher end offering. They've got great domain knowledge in that space. Uh, um, they have a wholesale business as well that in fact seems like it was quite a competitive advantage over the shortages in, in, uh, during COVID. And, it, and allowed their core safari outdoor um, to really gain a lot of market share. They've got family pet center uh, that they've, they've been trialing in, in uh, the pet markets. Um, so, and, and I'll get to how they value that at some point, uh, a little bit later, but shifting around, they've got RECM caliber. I will get to this. We, it's coming up later because this is separately listed, but the key underlying there is Gold Rush. And Gold Rush is a gaming betting LPM um, business. They've got diamond mining, which I've lumped together, but it's really marine mining and marine diamond mining and, um, and Transex. And Transex uh, is, is different from a marine diamond mining, but because there's a spot element here where you you're being influenced by the diamond price for ease of reference, uh, put them together. Um, although arguably the marine diamond mining is, is quite specialized and there's few in there. Um, you've got Liat Corporation. Liat Corporation offers safety equipment for uh, barking and motoring. Um, let's, let's call it the uh, out, outdoor wheel, wheel and action orientated market. In, interesting enough, Great brand name in that space and very export oriented, quite a large niche market uh, to look at. ISA Carstens operates in the beauty as, as an educational play, but within the beauty space. You've got Vehicle Care Group that really offers, uh, it's, let's call it working capital funding into the car dealership industry. Um, and then Astoria Treasury which is really their share buyback program. So we set that off um, and that comes out in, in, uh, in less issued shares. But broadly, what, what do you see here? Well, you see a diversified portfolio. I would say diversified, but, but SA Inc. orientated with some good hard currency in the diamond mining and Liat corporation. Um, the majority of it is unlisted, which my first question when I see that is how do you value it? And a key element in how they value outdoor investment holdings is they value it at six times rolling 12 month EBIT. Another way of phrasing that is for ease of reference, 
for for the public uh, listening in on this is imagine a retail operation being valued at six times price earnings. So relatively conservative versus, for example, the large cars trading at much higher multiples uh, on, on the JSC in the retail sector. Um, what is the whole co cost of percentage of NAV? One and a half to 1.9% of NAV. Um, what does that determine? Well, that, that dictates an appropriate uh, discount to NAV of about 15%. What is the current, current discount against NAV? It's 40%. But the NAV is mostly unlisted, so are we comfortable with how it's valued? And as I said, when, when, you, when you dig through, it's quite a conservatively valued NAV. Um, six times rolling EBIT on the launches investment, as, as an illustrative example, is not an aggressively valued NAV, so that discount feels a bit large. Um, what is a benefit is the Mauritian structure that provides tax benefits here. It's worth noting, though, that they do have an external manco. Um, but management are co-investors here as well. Um, so that provides comfort in terms of alignment of interests. Shifting from Astoria to Breit. Uh, Breit recently IPO their premier foods on the JSC. It's worth noting that they realized 3.6 million cash. I have tried to set that off against debt. Um, it is worth noting though, that pre-RPO, they were valuing their premium foods at 10.2 billion in their NAV, but the market cap is actually 7.6 on, on, on the JSE. This implies that the NAV might be too aggressively valued. And this is part of the problem of listed versus unlisted. Listed, we can just buy it directly. So why, why have it? But it does create a firmer NAV. The, you can have wonderfully sounding businesses on paper in the unlisted space, but are they actually worth what you're saying they're saying? And my sense is Premier Foods, they needed to realize the capital and part of the problems in Breit is that they have a, a large amount of debt. In fact, if, if I their debt is so large, I've included in, in, in the uh, portrayal of their portfolio and you could see it's a quarter, even after I've set off the 3.6 million in cash. Um, but it does, it does make me slightly less comfortable in terms of premium foods. That said, I have tried to update the net asset value, not for the disclosed value of premium foods, but for the market price of the premium foods, the remaining part unrealized by them. What is left? Oh, and what is premium foods? Well, best understood as a domestic bread company. They, they play in a range of branded food spaces. Uh, if you think of Tiger Brands, you think of AVR, RCL, um, but the core of these businesses is daily delivery of branded bread. Out of that backbone, they've gone into the other spaces, but that is the core. Listed food businesses in South Africa predominantly, with the exclusion of AVR, exclusion, they're predominantly bread businesses. Um, Virgin Active is the gyms, uh, gym side. Obviously, the exact wrong place to be in when people are worried about other people breathing on them during a pandemic and everyone's locked indoors. But the gym, the gym element has a strong annuity underpin. We don't quite know what the post-gym world looks like post-pandemic. So this makes me less comfortable in terms of the valuation of Virgin Active. Um, but it is in that space, and they are definitely, uh, definitely the uh, market leader. There's new look there. I wouldn't focus too much on five percent of the nav, and likewise, it's not a fantastic UK retail story. What? Uh, and I should have, unfortunately, and this is the challenge of covering so many companies in such a short space of time. Everything is moving as I'm building this presentation. Premier Foods gets listed. Um, they have not 100% of their NAV unlisted. It is in fact closer to eight, uh, 78% because Premier Foods is obviously now listed. Uh, whole co's percentage of NAV is, let's call it one to one and a half percent of NAV. What does that imply? That implies a discount of 14 to 20% somewhere there. Um, what is their current discount? 39%, you go, gosh, that's cheap, except, and this is the nuances you need to be careful for, their debt and some of their bonds are convertible. If we assume their bonds are converted in full, 
their NAV gets diluted and falls down to closer to 20%, which is what the market is pricing them at. And in fact, it feels appropriate given the risk here, given the complexity, and given the un perhaps the uncomfort in terms of the underlying NAV. Um, shifting to, in fact, the guys who are, uh, ethos is the guys unwinding breaks, by the way, this is not, and perhaps it's unfair to apply an overly aggressive discount because this whole co is unlikely to be here in the long term. Ethos was hired to drive a final realization process. That's a fancy way of selling everything, settling all the debt and returning all the capital to everybody. Um, uh, and therefore in Ethos's own listed uh, whole co, which is EPE Capital Partners, they've got Breits NAV. Now, I don't think you should include Breits NAV at its NAV. You should include it at its share price. So I've gone about that. Um, but if we if we dig through EPE's uh, portfolio, 20% is sitting in Breits, 25% in Optasia. That was previously called Channel Vaz. It's really a fintech play, micro lending, etar, credit, data services. Um, these are great businesses at scale, difficult businesses to analyze because there's lots of lots of moving parts, lots of transactions, lots of plug 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 into networks, and lots of opaqueness in what it does. Let's call it a transactional fintech play. That's the largest investment. Um, they've they've got dual exposure. They're they're in the break EBE structure. They've got a range of other, and it's gonna to take too long. So for the sake of time, I'm not gonna dig through, but they're co-investors into a lot of Ethos's own private equity uh, investments and into their funds. And this is, in my opinion, one of the problems here is that EPES Capital Partners has an external manco and they invest into Ethos's own private equity funds of different maturities. Um, and this creates a range of risks and a range of costs. We don't have clean line of sight mm -hmm. to how much duplication of costs is there, not just in the listed whole code, but in the actual private equity funds they're invested into and then into the underlying investments themselves and how are each one of those uh, valued. What we do have, and they, and they have wonderfully detailed uh, presentations in terms of the underlying valuations, but if we have a look at the unlisted portfolio, and this is worth pointing out, excluding Breit, but about 77% of Ethos, EPE Capital Partners, is uh, unlisted. And that unlisted part is valued on a on an EV EBITDA of about 8.82, uh, about 8.2%. What does that mean? Well, EV EBITDA, is almost like a debt, a debt neutral price earnings. Um, if we look at how the market is valuing them as a discount to NAV, it implies that the market is in valuing, and if we assume that the market is accurately valuing them, it is valuing the, those unlisted companies are closer to a 5.5 times EV EBITDA. So there is a disconnect and it is hard to say, given the spread of the underlyings and particularly the larger weightings in fintech, which, you know, if, if you'd gone back two years, three years, and you looked for a market multiple in terms of fintech offerings and you looked off offshore for global peers, this might have been an insanely much higher multiple. You know, is, is 8.2 versus 5.5 a fairer multiple? Much harder, but what I can say is that the, our best estimate in terms of whole code cost as a percentage of NAV is one and a half to 1.75. That's with the risk of duplications of cost and push down to funds. Um, let's, let's say a fair discount on pure perpetuity is closer to 15 to 20. It does seem like there's some value here, especially if they manage to unlock the NAV in Brait correctly. It does feel overly onerous what the market is uh, as applied to them, but uh, there there are a range of there are a range of questions here and a range of complexity and, and the key questions are not mark to market 
unlisted portfolios, but once you realize them for cash, what are they worth? Um, shifting from EPE Capital Partners to almost the polar opposite, Hosking's Consolidated Investments is almost entirely listed. So we don't need to worry about valuations of the underlying businesses so much here. Uh, we can merely look at what the market guides us as, update that, get a sense of comfort for the portfolio, and then consider the cost of the hold co and what sort of discount should be sitting here. So what is HCR hold? Well, if its famous holdings are in the gaming, casino, and hotel space. Now, previously, this was called Sogo Sun. Sogo has been unbundled into Togo Gaming, which is the casino side of the business, and what was previously called Togo Hotels, it is now rebranded re into, I uh, forgive the spelling mistake there, Southern Sun Hotels, and that's the chunk of, of the business. Not a great space to be in during lockdowns and COVID, but well positioned as tourism picks up, well positioned uh, in terms of, of, of being a market leader with really valuable but old school gaming assets, we will get to this valuation of, of Togo Sun Gaming when we get to uh, RECM Calibre Prefs a little bit later. Um, then we have a look at e-media holdings. They've got end shares and the controlling shares, um, otherwise known as e-media holdings. Really, what is that? That is ETB. That's the e-media uh, side of the business. Uh, Frontier Transport was previously known as uh, Ooh, I'm suddenly having a blank moment. It was the gold, uh, not gold star buses. Golden arrow. Golden arrow. That is it. That is it. Golden arrow uh, buses rebranded in Frontier as Transport. They they shifting slightly broader and picking up more routes in the personal logistics space. Uh, Deneb is an interesting amalgamation of industrial properties. Um, and in fact, uh, some gaming and distribution businesses, interesting anecdote aside, Deneb holds distribution rights domestically for the Xbox. Um, I think it would be valued a lot higher if it was PlayStation, but you can see where my gaming interests lie. Um, but they've got the Xbox distribution rights. The African Energy Corporation's got a range of um, oil and gas exploration rights around uh, Africa, of which the most notable are Namibia, that are on the news, and is sitting in uh, Brill Pada, which is South Africa. What is interesting is we don't need to guess what those are valued for. It is listed. Platinum metal, platinum group metals, it's got a PGM mine that Impala passed on taking the option, which is worth noting. It does beg the question because to take this mine to the next level, you need a large amount of funding and the natural buyer, uh, the natural realization of this business or this mine was to, um, to Impala. We will see where it goes, but once again, listed, uh, listed price, we've got properties and net debt, and we've got a little bit of net debt in the center. This is the unlisted part we will take, but it is the minority of the business. So what is the common, commonality across all of these. Well, typically, and interesting enough, if you have a look at Johnny Copeland coming out of the unions and building this business, his background is a lawyer. And all of these businesses, almost every single one of them has legal barriers to entry. Casinos need gaming licenses, media needs media uh, licenses, you've got bus routes, you've got mining and oil and gas rights, all of these things, legal barriers to entry. But interesting enough, the weight of this is sitting domestically. This is an SA Inc. listed uh, Holdco. Once again, hard to unpack Holdco costs, but our sense is it, is it costs in the range of, let's call it one and a half to 2% of NAV to manage uh, the Holdco, which implies a discount of 16 to 20%. Interestingly enough, and perhaps driven by the large early stage, particularly out of Namibia, oil and gas discoveries being, being discovered there, the share is trading at a 0% discount to current NAV. 
Um, the problem is it's difficult to value these early stage oil and gas investments. To some degree, though, we can look at the market valuation of that, translate that back into South African rands and see where this sits. Um, shifting to the big daddies, NASPERS and Process, um, these, are, these two companies are two of the largest listed companies on the JSC. And interesting enough, they are Hold Co's too. Part of the challenge here is that there's a cross shareholding, which makes this a bit of a mind bender. But NASPERS holds, holds 70 odd percent of process and process holds just less, of, less than half of NASPERS. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that you can't view these companies in isolation. You have to view these companies together because the underlyings of the one are the underlyings of the other in a proportional manner. So, what? but what are the underlyings? Well, first of all, NASPERS's underlying is mostly process. So if we look at process, it's underlying. The majority of that is Tencent. And Tencent is the big tech Chinese play. Along with Alibaba, there is now being split into smaller units. So a, perhaps as a, a, to lower the Chinese tech scrutiny, but also to unlock value. Tencent hasn't yet gone that route. Uh, it remains listed. We have a listed share price. It is managed in China. We don't need to guess what it is valued as. We know what it is valued at. If we look at the rest of the group, well, what is the commonality here in process? Well, it's in food delivery, e-learnings, e classifieds, e-marketing. It's really they're trying to build what I would argue is commoditized platform tech-enabled businesses. Um, and that's the side of the business that, interesting if the market basically values at zero, if you assume 10 cent is fairly valued and we chop out a comfortable little fair value. But I'll, I'll get for that because this is processes, assets, you need to view through the lens of NASPERS when viewing NASPERS. So now, this creates an interesting discussion, and this is a philosophical discussion in terms of the whole co costs, because the management who sit in NASPERS and in process do not manage ten cents. They can all, that can almost be viewed as a passive investment, and actually, if anything, they've been selling it. So what do they manage? What what do they do every day, day in and day out? Where do they where do they, where do they allocate capital? Well, it's this portion of the portfolio in effectively the fintech, e-classifieds, e-learnings, food delivery side of the business. So when we, what are, and why is it relevant? Well, how do we compare those costs of the whole co relevant to the underlying NAV? And if we have a look at processes, whole co costs versus its NAV, it's 0.2 to 0.5% of process. Likewise, 0.3 to 0.5% of NASPERS. It, these sound like incredibly efficient holdcos, but consider that NASPERS as a holdco holds a holdco, which is process. Therefore, should we not take processes holdcos into NASPERS? And the moment I do that, NASPERS's holdco costs, including processes holdco costs, are actually closer to 0.5 to 1% of NASPERS. But if I consider only the active part of the portfolio that effectively management manage and not the passive part that is Tencent, and I compare then the whole co costs against that active allocation of capital, well, process is actually much closer to half a percent of uh, whole co's percentage of active NAV, and Tencent is a whopping 2.6% approaching 3% of, Na uh, of NASPERS's active underlying, once again, having a look at the look through on, on uh, the active part of the portfolio. Now, what is an appropriate discount here? Well, these are global businesses. Tencent is in China. These investments are literally all around the world. We cannot use South African 
cost of capital in South African inflation. So I've assumed that the Fed in America hits their target long-term average of 2% inflation. And I've taken a 10-year a a US dollar bond rate as an indicative global risk-free rate. Um, I've calculated a perpetuity based on these costs. And we arrive at an indicative process discount of between 6 to 10% on its NAV and NASPERS discount of 20 to 30% on its NAV. Remember, NASPERS is a whole is a whole co of a whole co. So it's compounding discounts um, because it's got not one layer of cost, it's actually got two layers of cost between it and its investments. What does it currently look like now? Fast moving exchange rates and share prices. And the moment I put this pen on paper, it's out of date. But at the point where I calculated this process was trading at about 25 to 30% discount to NAV, NASPERS at 37 to 40% discount to NAV. So these do look relatively cheap against their implied uh, discounts against their NAV, but 10 cent is held through a risky VAR structure, which is legally unchallenged gray area stuff. Um, and that means that this NAV could evaporate if legally challenged by the Chinese authorities. Also, we're assuming that the fair values of a lot of these assets are correct. We're, we're not penalizing NASPERS for having an unlisted control structure. And the moment you take into account these risks that hark the discount one should demand against its implied discount to NAV. Perhaps these are actually fairer discounts. And for one of the largest, most liquid, most traded stocks on the JSC, well, two of them, NASPERS in process, we shouldn't be surprised when the market is fairly valuing them. And it's an efficient market at these levels. So then jumping to RECM and Caliber, um, this is an interesting one. It's a listed preference share where over the years, they've realized value. And in fact, it's, it's getting increasingly having a single asset and the single asset is Gold Rush with 75% of the sum of parts in Gold Rush. What is Gold Rush? It's, a, a, it's really a gaming company, but a, it's a new style gaming company. Limited payout machines, e-bingo gaming and betting, that new age distributed, flexible, agile, online OPM business, I will get to why that's relevant in a moment. But the majority of uh, RCM and Caliber prefs underlying net asset value is unlisted. Their whole co costs are actually quite efficient, 0.3%, dictating a very low discount, 2 to 5%. Their current discount to NAV is 21%, but the NAV is unlisted. So how is it valued? Well, it's valued at seven times EV EBITDA multiple. If we assume that this, the market is correct, it's valuing it at 5.5 times. Which one is correct? Well, Sogo Gaming is currently at a six and a half times EBA, but our Sun International at five times, Las Vegas Sands win offshore on forward EBA, of 13 to 15. What is correct? Well, one could look at Sogo and Sun International and say perhaps 5.5 times is fair and the market is correct here. Yeah. But Sogo Gaming and Sun International are older school legacy big casino gaming assets that are in the fact losing market share over time to the LPM uh, e-bingo side in the gaming. And in fact, Gold Rush and LPM players are, are taking up market share and are growing. So perhaps a premium is, is, is uh, justified here. Here's the question. Should RECM Caliber be valued as a whole co? It is increasingly becoming, in fact, an, an opco. It's got an operational single asset, and should we not be looking at an earnings based valuation? Jumping to Raynet, its underlyings are uh, British American Tobacco, Pension, which everyone should know, Pension Insurance Corporation, which, uh, which operates predominantly in, in, entirely in the UK market, is my understanding. It's in the pension risk transfer market. What is that? That's complex. And, uh, yeah, obscure sounding. It's quite simple. In in the UK, there are a lot of defined benefit pension schemes. That means you guarantee your pension pensioners will get certain payouts. 
that creates a liability on the company's balance sheet that isn't the, their core business in managing this. The pension insurance corporation turns around and says, we can solve that for you. And here's the price. Simplistically, there's different ways they can solve it. I'm not going to get into that, but that's their business model. And that's a big business. They do well in that. Even though they're unlisted, they've got a large market sh share here against the other few operators. And you, know, you need big balance sheet to operate in the space. You need to know what you're doing. These guys are, have a big balance sheet. They know what they're doing. How does Raynet value them on comparable company multiples derived from public information of listed peer groups? It, they value them as if they were listed. Um, British American Tobacco is listed, and we've got a, a smattering of private equity um, really invested in Europe and Asian, pan-Asian private equity that is interesting. Um, when we have a look at Raynet, what really jumps out is the efficiency of the whole co structure. Very, very little cost of this whole co structure, which implies because it is a global business. You'll notice British American Tobacco is not South African. PRC is not South African. That's Pension Insurance Corporation, not South African. Pan-African private equity or Pan-Asian private equity is not South African. So using global risk-free perpetuity, we arrive, this should be trading closer to two to 5% discount in that, but it's trading at 33% discount in that. Jumping to Remgrow, a lot of these businesses are locally listed. A lot of them, the audience will know. I do feel like I'm running a bit out of time. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to dive into that. But Remgrow, unlike Raynet being a global uh, whole code, Remgrow is almost entirely diversified SA Inc. and heavily listed even on the JSC. Once again, also quite efficiently run as a whole go percentage of NAV appropriate discount to NAV implied against this. It's also actually two to 5%. They're currently trading at a 43% discount, which feels quite onerous. Management is in the process of unlocking the discount. There's a range of transactions they've done. Even this, just this week, our RCL has sold Vector Logistics to try to unlock, unlock some value. Um, even if we uh, look, at, look across this portfolio, and we're negative in South Africa, one has to assume that a lot of that is embedded into the share prices here. And this is still heavily discounted against that. Subvest Capital got a range of unlisted businesses. Um, some of, like with global reach, SA, SA Bias has Flomax that operates in the UK, um, Narratex that operates domestically, but is in almost a strong export business. Um, we've got RTL, that's Intelligent Label uh, Group. They, they're really a gr global player in the labeling business, servicing fashion industry. Think about it. If a, if a NAC uh, or a, if a NAC clothing item goes out there and it doesn't have the NAC sign on it and the NAC label, is it a NAC thing? Where does the, where's the branding power in that? NAC doesn't make that. And yeah, that's just top of mind, but they deal with all big fashion uh, fashion and apparel players globally, and they're really, really strong in that group. Um, then we've got DNR, 4PL. They are domestic, but the best way to view them is on the telco's distribution side, perhaps a little closer to home. They probably hate this comparison, but blue. Uh, imagine a blue label telecoms without the sell C uh, dragnet on, on um, wonderful business. They they are gaining great market share. ALB Holdings was listed. Um, we've got Apex Partners that is growing a diversified industrial uh, 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 holding business. Just looking towards the UK, that's gonna be interesting to see how it play, plays out. Got transaction capital. I expect to field some questions on that uh, the, this evening, but it's 1% of their NAV. And in fact, we actually back management there. Um, what, what does it look like? Well, it's really a diversified industrial financial services uh, and predominantly unlisted net asset value. Um, when we have a look at the cost of the whole car, one and a half 
uh, odd percent of NAV implies an appropriate discount of about 15% against its net asset value. Its current net asset value is trading at 25%. The question on, on the unlisted space is, well, how is that unlisted NAV uh, valued? It's valued very consistently on conservative EBITDA multiples. And in fact, there, there's year on year those multiples, there, there's been on a weighted average basis, almost no expansion of those multiples. This is when the NAV grows, it grows from either realizations, which are actually the minority, these are long-term portfolios, but mostly from driving earnings at, at a business level. And we can see this when we have a look at, and this is quite a quite an impressive track record, the net asset value over time has consistently over 15 years compounded at 17%, 10 years, 19%, five years, 16%. And so on and so on and so on. The track record here is, is wonderful at growing its real nav. And the growth has come from earnings, not from multiple expansion. Servest has an internal man curve. The CEO is a major shareholder. They use a partnership principle where the underlying management teams running these uh, businesses are large investors in the individual businesses and Servest partners with them. The track record speaks for itself. Universal partners, I don't want to linger too much on this, is deeply illiquid. Majority of investments are in the UK, or almost all of them are in the UK. Uh, they're all unlisted. It's a very expensive holdco, which implies quite a large discount. It's trading at a larger discount to, to its net asset value, but that's probably due to the illiquidity of the share. One has to take that into account and our calculation of a discount against NAV doesn't always take into account illiquidity and Universal Partners has quite extreme illiquidity. What does this all mean? Running through that portfolio um, and putting it onto, onto a spreadsheet, well, if I compare discounts to NAV and I compare against cost to NAV, um, i.e. the whole code cost to NAV, what you don't want is you don't want to pay a premium to NAV and you don't want an expensive uh, hold co as a percentage of NAV. I've also visually represented process and Tencent. Uh, the blue versions of them are taking into account Tencent um, and uh, the, the red versions are taking out Tencent as a percentage of, of, uh, of NAV looking at the hold co costs. And you can see that process there is other things happening in there but NASPERS is exceptionally expensive compounding costs and whole co costs on whole co costs on NAV. Um, what does jump out and well positioned is those outside of here. My sense is anything two and a half plus perhaps even two percent plus as a cost of, of NAV uh, is too expensive um, and anything at a premium to NAV is too expensive. This is the good quadrant. Um, perhaps very key because management, underlying management can, five minutes after you invest in the whole code, sell the entire portfolio and invest it into different investments. You're effectively partnering with management here. So one has to consider what is their track record in terms of growth. And here is a different view of the whole code market where I've taken the five year average, uh, five year compounded net asset value growth, trying to take into account dividends that have been paid as well. So you, and having a look at the growth, you at least want to beat inflation. Uh, there are some, some penalizations here that are perhaps not fair because there's been value unlock and unbundlings and the like. But what does jump out at me is Savvest is, is, has a superb track record in long term. Uh, Astoria has done well too. Uh, Remgro and Raynet have held their own. Raynet, one needs to consider Rand weakness in this. When you take Rand weakness out, that is there's less shine in the portfolio, but we are South African investors, and this is a JSE Holco investment uh, uh, view. So one needs one needs to view it as is. Um, and an argument could be made to not look at these over five years, 10 years, three years, 15 years, and this would shift around. I need to compare like with like, so I've, I've decided five years because it's been such a mess of a period of time to consider that it does show some, some agility to manage through good times, bad times, pandemics, lockdowns, floods, riots, and the like. So I've 
I've dug a, uh, quite a bit into question time. I'm going to summarize conclusion and our views in terms of the ones we like. Hold co's are effectively companies that invest in other companies. And so the layer of costs, we need to demand a discount against NAV. Um, and that depends on the costs, but we need to consider the NAV listed versus underlisted. If it's unlisted, the how it has been valued, not all the whole codes are made the same. What must we consider? The diversity, the uniqueness, the growth, whole code structures, are there benefits to those structures, the discounts to NAV, and don't forget management track record. The ones that jump out are quite clearly the ones that sit here that are on the good side of the quadrant. And those are clearly Savers Capital, why discount to NAV, great track record, unique underlying portfolio. Raynet, large discount to NAV, deeply defensive portfolio, free option on private equity is, is a great rand hedge as a global hold co. Astoria, also wide discount to an unlisted NAV that actually looks quite reasonably valued. Good growth in NAV. Uh, there is a new manager who has refocused the portfolio and we will see portfolio actions going forward. Um, REM grow, when also good discount to NAV, um, largely listed portfolio, but largely SA Inc. portfolio, as opposed to Rainier's global one. They have achieved a reasonable growth in NAV. Uh, value unlocks are being attempted by management. We will see over time how successful they will be. These are the ones that sit not overly onerously expensive whole codes. They also had good track records in terms of growth. They, they don't have the complexity and nuance of whole codes and whole codes and looping structures, process and NASPERS, and one arguments with 10 cents. So I've, I've stepped back from that. That's a much bigger call. Um, and they offer unique, good, and attractive and discounted NAV with, with good management teams. Um, going to open for questions. Uh, apologies. At, there's a, there was just so much to go through. I've, I've had to summarize. Uh, Simon, it's over to you. No, Keith, that's perfect. I mean, we, we're pretty, practically out of time. I'm not seeing many questions coming, but I mean, more importantly is that we've got a, a huge amount of content there. One is Leber Hung's asking, he's saying so private equity business can list in the, on the stock exchange. And Leber Hung, yeah, I mean, Keith Breach used to be a good old fashioned private equity if we go back, what, 15 years perhaps or so? Yes, uh, so Brett, Brett, original, Brett effectively founded private equity in South Africa, is my understanding. A um, little bit before my day, they're founding, but yes, and, and, and the thing is, they didn't just invest in private equity, they managed private equity. What I mean by that was Brett had its own private equity funds, and then it was the man co-managing them, and it would invest, invest alongside them. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like Ethos has done with EPE Capital Partners, except Ethos is the Manco and they're unlisted. Great wasn't. Great was listed. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Ah, gotcha like that. A, a great question coming through. Uh, Bitvest not considered a hold co. I, so, I mean, I can see the point, but I suppose they are more operational perhaps. So in the legal definition, um, I, I, most of the companies on the JSC are hold codes because they have a hold code structure and they have yeah, operating yeah. subsidiaries. But it, it also depends how they allocate capital, where, where the market classification is, and um, really how they run. Bitvest is legally a hold code, but underlying it, it manages its businesses as opcos. It has it's it's there to extract growth and free cash flow, and it is it is not you know perhaps if we go back to this definition on the jse it does not fit section 15 investment entities including having an investment policy that is stated and approved by shareholders uh -huh. yeah. um consider for a moment that its principal activity is not investing in securities its principal business is managing its underlying businesses and it it doesn't really have minority investors in its underlying businesses. Uh, it owns them wholly and therefore owns the free cash flows and manages them like that. Lots of other businesses can, can be yeah. viewed that way. Um, leg legally, they might be that, but no, 
they're they're trading businesses. Yeah, I get you. It's that, that opco versus holdco, and, and and I mean sometimes it's a bit of a grey line, yeah. but I, I, I take your point in it, folks. I'm gonna I'm gonna park it there. Uh, a, a few questions, very few questions. I think Keith has has totally bamboozled our brain. I wasn't expecting the the extent of 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 the content coming in. Uh, everyone's asking when when the when the video will be up. Uh, it could be up, let's say late. Let's say when you wake up tomorrow morning, just one lap dot com. You'll find it there. You'll find Keith on the Twitters. Uh, you'll find him at Integral Asset managers of course keith really appreciate that was a that was a magnus opus that was giant that was way huge um and absolutely worth every minute of it